Hello and welcome to IP Economics. Today we um, conclude with the final topic in the market failure section of the microeconomics course. And specifically today we're looking at asymmetric information and monopoly power. 1.14 high level topic asymmetric information and monopoly power. Asymmetric information, what is it? Adverse selection occurs when one party in a transaction has more information than the other, leading to a negative consequence for the party in the dark. This often happens in insurance and finance-related activities when certain customers make the service being offered unprofitable or less profitable. Insurance companies face the most risk from adverse selection. If they offer insurance policies at a specific price but fail to factor in a risk that is unknown to them at the time, they will find themselves paying for more claims than anticipated. For instance, ABC Insurance Corporation quoted Jim a $50 per month premium for term life insurance. If ABC failed to ask and Jim failed to disclose the fact that he is an avid skydiver, then ABC is taking more risk on insuring Jim's life than they bargained for. More avid thrill seekers will purchase insurance from ABC, and ABC's life insurance business will become unprofitable. To prevent adverse selection, companies must either place controls on the use of their product or enact better customer screening procedures. Okay, so this is all about information failure. Um, so this happens whenever one party to an economic transaction, the buying or the selling of a good or service, possesses greater knowledge than the other party. And just about all economic transactions involve information and symmetries, and they lead to market failure. So imperfect information and market failure... So one of the conditions for perfectly competitive markets is that all firms and all consumers have perfect knowledge regarding the product, price, resources and methods of production. But we know this is um, literally impossible. Markets in the real world are full of examples where consumers and suppliers and the owners of resources have to make decisions where at least some information is missing. Sellers can have more information than buyers and buyers can have more information than sellers. Where sellers have more information than buyers, this um, a classic example is a second ca second hand car. The owner of the second hand car that's just about to sell it or trade it in to the car dealer, the owner knows all the faults and all the problems, and it's not in her interest to inform the buyer of all these. If she does, she's going to get a lower price. And in the situation where buyers have more information than sellers, the classic example is the purchase of insurance. The consumer knows more about her risky behaviour than the insurance company does. Okay, sellers having more information than buyers. So selling a used car, that's an easy, nice easy example to understand. The used car salesman will know whether or not there are faults with any particular car and where the faults lie. An unscrupulous car salesman may choose not to inform the potential customer of this fact. And without this knowledge, the customer will place a greater value on the benefit he or she would gain from purchasing the car than if he or she had perfect knowledge of the good. Our used car consumer is paying a price which is higher than that she would have paid had she had all the available information. So therefore, asymmetric information leads to, to failure in the used car market. Okay, price, benefit and cost on the y-axis, quantity of used cars on the x. MSC equals MPC equals supply. Marginal social cost equals marginal private cost equals supply. Marginal social benefit equals uninformed demand and this is a market equilibrium and it's inefficient if the buyer knows everything about the used car 
then the MSB shifts downwards and to the left and this reflects informed demand. Knowing those faults, knowing those um, problems with the car leads to less demand. The marginal social benefit there. So the socially optimal um, equilibrium is where MSB equals MSC with informed demand. Right, how the market fails. The marginal private benefit is greater than the marginal social benefit when suppliers of a good or service have information about that product that they don't share with consumers. And as we can see in the figure below, the market equilibrium is inefficient because the marginal social cost is greater than the marginal social benefit, meaning that the cost of resource being used to produce the next unit of output is more than the benefit gained by society from consuming it. Too many resources are being misallocated to producing the good, and the price of the good and the unit output are both higher than they ideally should be. The market doesn't achieve allocative efficiency when there is imperfect information. Demand for the product decreases when consumers have all of the necessary information about the particular good or service. Providing consumers with all information is going to correct the market failure caused by information asymmetry. When consumers do have all of the available information, they have perfect knowledge of a good or a service, they are going to be able to value the next unit of consumption less. Price consumption and output are going to fall and less resources will be allocated to producing the good or service. With perfect information, the socially optimal equilibrium will then be achieved and that is where marginal social benefit equals marginal social cost. Previously, we discussed asymmetric information and how that can cause adverse selection in markets. In this video, we'll tackle how asymmetric information can lead to moral hazard. Let's start with an example. Imagine you're buying a bottle of water. You probably have a pretty good idea of what you're getting, H2O, especially if you've bought the same brand of water before. The information that the seller and the buyer have is pretty close to equal. But things get more complicated if you're dealing with something like repairing your car. The mechanic says you need a Johnson rod. Do you? Do you even know what a Johnson rod is? The mechanic knows a lot more about car repair than you do, and that makes it hard to know whether the mechanic is correct or even telling the truth. You might end up paying a lot of money for car repairs you don't really need. This is another example of asymmetric information, where one party to an exchange has more or better information than the other party has. As we'll see, asymmetric information can challenge markets and sometimes cause them to fail. When one party to an exchange has an information advantage, they may have an incentive to use that advantage to exploit the other party, and that temptation to exploit is called moral hazard. The car repair problem is just one example of asymmetric information and moral hazard. A taxi driver has more information about the roads than does a tourist. He may take a longer route in order to get a higher fare. A restaurant owner knows more about the safety of his restaurant than does his insurance company. He might choose to skimp on sprinklers if he's got fire insurance. An employee knows what he's been working on all day, whereas the manager maybe does not. The employee might choose to goof off rather than do his job. These examples highlight a concept called the principal agent problem. Often when you hire someone, that person has more information than you do. Indeed, that's often why you pay to hire them. In the case of your car, you are the principal and the mechanic is your agent. Your incentive is to get your car fixed and not waste too much money. His incentive might be to get as much money out of you as possible. Given that he has information about cars that you don't, he can lie to charge more. 
In this case, there are conflicting incentives, and you don't have the information to know a good deal from a bad deal. Ideally, you would like to align the incentives of the mechanic with yours so you don't get swindled. That is, at least in principle, how you can solve a principal agent problem. No one likes to be ripped off, but the problem of moral hazard runs deeper than just the ripoff. The bigger problem is that the potential for a ripoff means that a transaction may be less likely to occur in the first place. If you know the mechanic may recommend more service than is necessary, you might, for instance, pass on some recommended precautionary repairs and just wait until your car breaks down. Of course, that can be inefficient. You'd prefer to perform that preventive maintenance and not break down unexpectedly. But because of asymmetric information, you can't trust your agent, the mechanic, and so you pass on those repairs for fear of being ripped off. So we can see that asymmetric information can impede trade and limit the great benefits of specialization through markets. So what can we do? Well, take a moment to think about this, and perhaps you can anticipate some of the solutions we'll discuss in the next video. If you want to test yourself, click practice. Okay, so what can government, what's the government's response to asymmetric information? Regulation, provision of information, and a licensure are the three standard response. Okay, in a situation where buyers have more information than sellers, insurance services are an example of asymmetric information where the buyer is going to have more information than the seller of the insurance. Um, in certain circumstances, asymmetric information can lead to adverse selection or moral hazard. Consider adverse selection in life insurance or, the fire, or fire insurance. High risk insurance customers, such as smokers, um, the elderly or those living in dry environments, may be more likely to purchase insurance. Surgeons purchasing medical malpractice insurance may be less careful as a result, knowing that they'll be covered by the insurer if they make an error. With some income being guaranteed, individuals taking out unemployment protection insurance may not worry so much about losing their jobs. All examples of moral hazard. In each of these cases, individual consumers purchasing insurance have information about their future intentions that the insurance company just can't possibly have. In the free market, moral hazard is going to result in the under provision of resources to supply insurance services to the market. And that's a key point. Insurance companies will look to protect themselves from the higher costs associated with risky behaviours of the consumers of insurance. In the previous video, we introduced the ideas of asymmetric information and adverse selection, and we applied those ideas to the used car market. Let's take those same basic concepts and build a basic model of health insurance. Suppose that potential health insurance consumers come in a range of states of health. For instance, the least healthy people might cost about $30,000 a year. That's these folks here. The most healthy might cost nothing in health care. That's these folks over here. Now, consumers know this information, but by assumption, insurers don't. From the insurer point of view, everyone is of the same average health. Here again, we have asymmetric information. That is, consumers of health care have more information about their health status than insurers do. In this scenario, insurers have to price the coverage based on the average cost among all consumers, namely $15,000. But if the insurance costs $15,000, then a portion of the market, the relatively healthy people, they will choose not to buy insurance as the cost of that insurance is greater to them than the expected benefit. So only part of this market will buy insurance. The average cost of those who actually will buy is then not $15,000, but 
$22,500. In that case, the insurance company, if it tries to price at $15,000, loses money. If the insurance company instead raises the price to $22,500, well, the same dynamic is actually going to kick in again. That is, relatively healthy people won't find it worth paying that price, the sicker people still will buy, and that will raise the expected costs to the insurer, and thus the price, even further. This dynamic continues until the individual insurance firm finds there is no price at which it can attract a set of customers with health care costs lower than the price of insurance. This is the same death spiral we saw before with used cars, and it leads to a market failure. As we saw in the used car market, there are several reasons why reality may differ from this simple model. First, the model we laid out would predict that the healthy people, those who exercise, eat their veggies, and buckle their seatbelts, would not buy insurance, while the model is predicting that the smokers, the mountain climbers, and the motorcycle riders would buy insurance. Is this true? Mostly no. The people who buy health insurance actually turn out to be the healthier people as well. Why is that? Well, those who try to avoid risk by eating well also try to avoid risk by buying health insurance. Our initial assumption that everyone calculates costs and benefits in exactly the same way is too simple. Once you account for the fact that people have differential tolerances for risk, you can end up having the healthier people be those who choose to buy the health insurance. This is called propitious selection, where the people who buy the health insurance are healthier not sicker than average. This can keep costs low and prevent the death spiral. Another possible response to the adverse selection problem in health insurance might seem familiar. If you recall, we saw that services such as Carfax and certified inspections can alleviate the asymmetric information problem when buying a used car. These services allow the buyer of the car to have similar information to that possessed by the seller of the car. The result of this information is that better cars can sell for more and lemons can sell for less. Is there an analogous approach for people and health insurance? Well, yes, the health of people can be inspected, just as cars are inspected. So while consumers initially may have more information about their health than what the insurance companies have, a checkup will allow the insurance firms to get a better idea of a consumer's expected health care costs and that allows the insurance companies to charge healthy consumers less and sicker consumers more. In the used car market, that seemed like a pretty good solution. After all, better cars should sell for more and lemons should sell for less. In the health insurance market, that solution might work, but some people feel it is doubly unfair. Not only are the sick sick, but now they also have to pay more for their health insurance. Another problem with inspection is that it might reveal too much information, thereby rendering health insurance no longer viable. For instance, let's say there's a very good diagnostic test, and it determines that a patient, A, has cancer, and then B, we know that cancer will cost $1 million to treat. Well, to insure against that cancer, the price of the policy has to be about $1 million. But that's no longer insurance, that's just presenting the patient with a bill. Insurance is protecting against unexpected states of affairs, and it's a kind of risk pooling, a kind of protecting yourself against the high bill. But if you're getting the high bill no matter what when you're sick, well, then we've lost those benefits of insurance. Another solution to the adverse selection problem, one used extensively in the United States, is group health insurance through employers. Most people in America don't purchase insurance directly. Instead, their employer purchases it for them as part of a group plan. The benefit of this system is that the insurance company doesn't have to worry about adverse selection so much. The employer doesn't know much more about its employee's health than does the insurance firm. Furthermore, the employer is going to be buying health insurance for the employees regardless of their health. So for these reasons, the adverse selection problem is much weaker with group health insurance. Group health insurance, however, does cause other problems. If you lose your job, you can lose your health insurance. And what do we do about retirees? In the United States, various laws have made health insurance more portable, and furthermore, retirees are insured by the government under Medicare. So there are some solutions, albeit imperfect ones, as usual. 
The most recent approach to the adverse selection problem was implemented in the Affordable Care Act, otherwise known as Obamacare. Under the Affordable Care Act, everyone is supposed to buy health insurance. If you don't, you will be fined by law. The idea here is to force all the healthy people into the pool of those who buy insurance that will moderate the cost of health insurance and we will avoid the death spiral. As you can see, although the adverse selection model is pretty simple, it has lots of applications to some pretty complex real-world problems. Next up, we'll tackle moral hazard. See you then. Uh, mo monopolistic power. Moving away from asymmetric information. Welcome to the Investors Trading Academy talking glossary of financial terms and events. Our word of the day is monopoly. A monopoly situation is when a single company or group owns all or nearly all of a market for a given type of product or service. By definition, monopoly is characterized by an absence of competition, which often results in higher prices and inferior products. According to a strict academic definition, a monopoly is a market containing a single firm. In such instances where a single firm holds monopoly power, the company will typically be forced to divest its assets. Anti-monopoly regulation protects free markets from being dominated by a single entity. A pure monopoly is a single supplier in a market. For the purposes of regulation, monopoly power exists when a single firm controls 25% or more of a particular market. Governments may grant a firm monopoly status, such as with a post office, which was given monopoly status by Oliver Cromwell in 1654. The Royal Mail Group finally lost its monopoly status in 2006 when the market was opened up to competition. A monopoly could be created following the merger of two or more firms. Given that this will reduce the competition, such mergers are subject to close regulation and may be prevented if the two firms gain a combined market share of 25% or more. For example, if you want to buy a new automobile and there's only one brand from which you can purchase your car, that brand will be considered to hold a monopoly. Monopolies are harmful because they allow one entity to set the price on goods without consideration for competitive, affordable pricing. This is because when there's a monopoly, there are no competitors. This leaves customers at the mercy of the monopolist. In the late 1990s, Microsoft faced several suits due to perceived violations of these antitrust laws. Had the Justice Department proved the company was in violation, Microsoft would have been forced to divide itself into subsidiaries in order to break up the potential monopoly. This is happening with Google in Europe at the present, and the most well-known case was in the US when the government forced the telephone companies to break into several regional businesses called Baby Bell. Okay, so for our purposes here, the definition for monopoly is a market in which one firm sells a good or service that has no close substitutes and in which barrier to entry prevents competition from new firms. New firms can't enter the market and we are going to look at um, monopolies in much more depth and we're going to model them um, in a later section when we look at theory of the firm. Again, a higher level topic. Monopolistic power. So this refers to how much control a firm has when it sets the price for the goods and services it provides. So a monopolist, a sole supplier of a good, has complete monopoly power because they are the entire industry for that good or service. A firm with monopoly power will determine the price it receives in the market by controlling how much of the good or service it supplies to the market. If it doesn't supply, if it su supplies limited quantities, then consumers are going to bid up the price to be able to obtain the good. A reduction in output will increase prices. As pr prices rise, producer revenues increase, as too does the profitability of the firm. In the market, the producer surplus increases and the consumer surplus decreases. At reduced output in the market and high monopoly pr prices, the increase in producer surplus is less than the loss of consumer surplus. And therefore, the market power of monopolist results in the loss of social welfare. Right, demand equals average revenue. Average revenue just being the price that the good is sold for. Market equilibrium. This is the efficient market equilibrium. 
supply equals the marginal cost. The efficient free market equilibrium achieves price equilibrium and quantity equilibrium, which is where MC equals AR. At this point, the social welfare is maximised, social welfare being consumer surplus plus producer surplus. The efficient and socially optimal equilibrium can only be achieved when firms don't have the power to affect the market supply and therefore the price of the good in the market. So the efficient market equilibrium, PEQE. And here goes our model for the monopoly. Marginal revenue is half of that of average revenue. It falls, um, the slope is twice as steep. Here is a quantity that the monopolist will provide in the market to maximize his or her profits. That's where MR equals MC determines the quantity provided by, by the monopolist, QM, and that in turn determines the price in the market, price monopoly, PM. So to maximize revenues and profits, the monopolist is going to decrease output to QM, and as a consequence of this, the price in the market will increase from PE to PM. Now the value placed on an additional unit of consumption is greater than the cost of the resources to firms to produce it. And we get dead weight loss coming into the market. Inefficient. Society has a loss of wealth on all output that's produced between QM and QE. In the diagram here, the loss of welfare is represented by the shaded triangles A, which is the loss of consumer surplus, and B, the pink triangle, loss of producer surplus. As outputs lost and price increases, there is an inefficient under allocation of resources to production of this good, and therefore the loss of welfare in market fails as a result of monopoly power. What can the government do? Governments can regulate, they can legislate, they can take industry, they can own industries themselves, and they can um, break down trade barriers, open up markets to um, imports, which will break monopoly power. 